Hi, and thank you for choosing to listen to my talk. I will be talking to you about, um, is the Hubble tension a headache or an opportunity? So let's get started. Because this is a conference dedicated to the Hubble tension, I'm not going to spend too long motivating it. I'll just state the most uh, often quoted tension um, in the two measurements. Uh, the Hubble tension is a discrepancy between two different uh, methods of determining the current expansion rate of the universe, one relying on an indirect estimate uh, from the early universe and using a cosmological model, and another, a direct measurement in the late universe, relying on astrophysical modeling. These two are now at a 4.4 sigma tension, and this anomaly has only grown, an anomaly we lovingly call the Hubble tension. But this is not the full story. There are several other measurements of the Hubble constant with several different methodologies of measuring them. It's a very active field of study and it seems to be turning into a discrepancy between the early universe and the late universe, which leaves us with a few broad questions. Is this tension real? During the conference, I'm sure you'll hear wonderful talks from observers who continue to investigate this incredibly important question. The thing is that so far we haven't found um, a compelling systematic that can explain away the tension. So we have to start asking if this tension explains new physics. This is the question that my talk will concentrate on. More specifically, I'll be discussing some of the important features if that any new physics solution should have. I'll talk about um, the early dark energy solution that my research proposed, which embodies these features. And finally, I'll talk about challenges ahead as we search for the new concordance model to replace lambda CDM. So let's get started. Um, in order to think about the uh, features that any new solution should have, we need to think about the causing microwave background, which is one of the measurements that disagrees with the local Hubble um, expansion rate. So here, this patchy map is the causing microwave background, and the patches on this map actually have a preferred patch size. This is what I will refer to as theta star or theta s. And this turns out to be roughly one degree on the sky. And it's an actual physical measurement. It's not something that we can uh, move around by changing the theory that we use to describe the Cossian microwave background. Moreover, it's extremely precisely measured, which means it can essentially stand in as a proxy for the CMB peak locations. So here we have theta star, and what this actually measures on the sky is this RS, the size of the sound horizon. What does the sound horizon mean? So before the causing microwave background was emitted, the very hot and dense universe uh, essentially had a plasma. Uh, in this plasma, we had pressure and density oscillations or sound waves. Um, the sound waves traveled some distance um, through the expanding universe until they couldn't anymore when the plasma no longer existed because the universe had become neutral and the causing microwave background was emitted. This maximal distance that sound waves traveled is what this RS is and we call it the sound horizon. That's what theta star is actually tracing on the sky. And we see this sound horizon at some measured angular scale based on the size of the sound horizon and the distance of the CMB from us. So uh, this measurement then, uh, can we can think about it in terms of how the universe has expanded. And here's our picture of that, where we have energy densities versus redshift. We have radiation in blue, matter in orange, and a cosmological constant dark energy in green. The distance between us and the cosmic microwave background depends on how the universe has expanded since the CMB was emitted at redshift roughly 1100. On the other hand, the size of the sound horizon depends on what was going on in the universe before the CMB was emitted. So what was happening in that primordial plasma? Again, this is also inversely proportional to the expansion rate, but it's inversely proportional to the expansion rate before the CMB was emitted. So, Knowing that we need to keep our theta star constant, which is an actual very precise measurement, we find that 
our sound horizon and our Hubble expansion rate are inversely proportional. This is something echoed by data, in fact. If you try and measure the sound horizon using late universe measurements versus early universe measurements, you again see the same disconnect that you see with the Hubble tension. In fact, you see exactly the flipped disconnect where we have a higher Hubble uh, parameter measured, we have a lower sound horizon measured. So you can actually recast the Hubble tension into a tension in measurements of the sound horizon. And this is something that we can exploit in order to try and solve the Hubble tension. So our requirements of any new physics solution, in order to stay consistent with the casting microwave background, we exploit this inverse proportionality. And because the CMB measured Hubble parameter is lower than uh, the direct measurement, we need to decrease RS so that H0 will increase because RS depends on the pre-CMB expansion rate, we have to increase the pre-CMB expansion rate to make this happen. What else do we need? Well, we have figured out a way to stay consistent with the CMB, and um, that's that and light, element, uh, light elemental abundances, or BBN, are the only measurements we have of the very, very early universe. But we actually have a ton more measurements in this area here. Most of these are individually consistent with lambda CDM. So the other thing that our new physics ideally shouldn't do, it should not introduce any new tensions with all of these numerous data sets. So our final requirement for any new physics solution is going to be leave the late universe unchanged, leave it consistent with lambda CDM. All right, armed with these, we can now try and solve this Hubble tension headache. So let's talk about how early dark energy embodies these features. Early dark energy, much like late time dark energy, at least initially behaves like a cosmological constant. So in terms of energy densities versus redshift, it too has this flat portion here. Then at some redshift, it rapidly vanishes, diluting away with some final equation of state parameter, which controls how rapid the slope is. The other two parameters of early dark energy are how much early dark energy we have, which controls the amplitude of this peak here, which shows you amount of early dark energy versus total energy density in the universe over redshift. And the last parameter of early dark energy is when this peak appears. So we have how much early dark energy, when it appears, and how fast it disappears. This is a pretty general model, and you can see that it embodies the requirements that we have. Moving around this peak, we are able to add a little bit of energy density to the early universe and increase the pre-recombination expansion rate. In the late universe, early dark energy altogether disappears, so we're leaving the late universe unchanged. Fantastic. This is a pretty phenomenal logical early dark energy, one which I have extensively explored. We realized that this kind of early dark energy could actually fully resolve the Hubble tension. We laid out the phenomenological features that early dark energy must have, and have, we have inspired numerous papers in the literature that embody exactly these features that all emulate early dark energy. Let me talk about two of the models that I personally have worked on for early dark energy. Let's start with the dissipated axion. <laughs> um, this is uh, based on a scalar field and on dark radiation. So when you have a scalar field, you can essentially imagine like a ball rolling down a hill uh, that experiences friction. In terms of a scalar field, a cosmological scalar field, uh, the friction we're experiencing is because the velocity of the scalar field is uh, damped because of the expansion of the universe. This is what happens to an uncoupled scalar field. For uncoupled dark radiation that doesn't talk to anything, not even the rest of the dark sector, radiation simply dilutes like a uh, redshift to the fourth. In the dissipative axion model, these are changed slightly. In, in addition to the um, Hubble friction that the scalar field experiences, we also have thermal friction that the scalar field will experience. This is the interaction of the scalar field with the dark radiation. Through this interaction, the scalar field 
produces dark radiation. So you have a source term here on this side in dark radiation. Um, and all in all, when you combine these two things, this is what the energy density versus redshift plot looks like. This is the same as I've been showing you before, where we have the usual amount of early dark energy, when the early dark energy appears and how fast it disappears. So the scalar field is initially frozen because of Hubble friction and you'll have a flat portion here at high redshift. And eventually the scalar field rapidly dumps all of its energy density into dark radiation and the dark radiation dilutes away like um, equation of state, a final equation of state of one third. So you have the same three early dark energy parameters showing up here as well. This particular model is really interesting because it's robust to the choice of the potential of the scalar field. All of these features that I have described, these dynamics will still occur regardless of what potential you pick. So that makes this um, model pretty interesting. Uh, I'm still working on this model and hope to have results out soon. Uh, you can follow me and I'll keep you posted. The other model that I have worked on is uh, the has been was inspired by uh, ultralight axion um, particles. Uh, when I say inspired by ultralight axions, what I mean is we picked up the potential for axions and added an exponent to that potential. So in practice, the potential now looks like this, where the exponent is controlling the slope of the potential. So again, you would have, say, a ball starting here on top. It rolls down the potential, goes through the minimum, and reaches maybe not as high on the other side. And that's what's happening in this plot here of scalar versus redshift. You have a ball that started near the top of the potential. It rolled through the minimum down to the other side, and again through the minimum to the other side, and so on, and keeps oscillating around the minimum. What the energy density of such uh, a scalar field then does is shown here where I have energy densities of various species versus redshift. So again, I'm showing you radiation and cold dark matter and also all of these ultralight axions. So you have, for example, if we follow the blue curve in all three places, you have the scalar field frozen because of Hubble friction initially close to the top of the potential. Then it rolls down through the minimum and to the other side and momentarily comes to a stop. And that's this flat portion. Again, it rolls down through the minimum to the other side, momentarily comes to a stop and so on. So you have this rolling feature um, in your energy densities as well. The dash dotted lines here are a fluid approximation to it. So you can pick up this full scalar field and solve the full scalar field, or you can just solve the phenomenology of the scalar field with this fluid approximation. Again, here, the rate of dilution of uh, the early dark energy is controlled by the exponent, this exponent in um, our potential. So depending on how steep the potential is, you change how fast the early dark energy vanishes. The other scalar field parameters are then, as usual, related to how much early dark energy we have and when the early dark energy appears. Let me show you some results for this particular model. Uh, this is a lot to take in, so I'll take you through the slide bit by bit. I am showing you results here based on data from the costing microwave background, the local Hubble measurement, baryon acoustic oscillations, and supernova data. Uh, I'm showing you when the scalar field uh, appears, the Hubble parameter, cold dark matter, and how much uh, early dark energy we have. The um, final rate of dilution of the early dark energy whoops, is uh, set by our exponent here, where we have dilution like radiation or faster. And I'm showing you lambda CDM and the local Hubble measurement as well over here. Let me draw your attention specifically to this square where we have in orange lambda CDM, and you can see the discrepancy between lambda CDM and the gray here, which is the local shoes measurement. What early dark energy does is it not only blows up the error on H0, but it also shifts the central value, which you can see from this 1D H0 plot here. The central value of H0 is also increased. With both of these effects together, early dark energy can resolve the Hubble tension. And this you can best see 
in the purple contours, where you can see that the purple contours intersect the gray at one within one sigma. So this is one model that resolves the Hubble tension. Um, at that time, the Hubble tension was slightly lower in 2018, but I'll also show you uh, plots where it does that for the newer Hubble measurement as well. I should say that what I've shown you here is the phenomenal logical early dark energy. So this is based on the ultralight axion model, but it's the fluid approximation to it. You can also approach this and say, I don't want to approximate it as a fluid. I want to use the full scalar field. And we can do that. My collaborators have done that in Smith et al. Here, again, let me draw your attention to this plot where we have Hubble versus cold dark matter. These are based on the same data sets updated for 2019 measurements. You have lambda CDM down here in blue, which has, again, the discrepancy with the local shoes measurement in gray. When you add early dark energy to your fits, you're able to increase the Hubble parameter to within one sigma of the local shoes measurement, where you can see that these contours, again, are intersecting at one sigma. Another thing I want to point out is that this best fit Hubble parameter and this best fit Hubble parameter are slightly different. So different early dark energy models wind up having slightly different um, final best fit Hubble parameters. So the actual details, the actual dynamics of your early dark energy model do matter. The second thing I want to say here is that for these data sets, we're actually finding that we are improving the chi-squared over lambda CDM. We are in fact improving the chi-squared fit to CMB data alone over lambda CDM with early dark energy. So that's another really exciting thing. So we've solved the Hubble tension, but how do we know if early dark energy actually exists? Well, um, upcoming CMB data could help us detect early dark energy. Specifically, um, Cosmic Variance Limited uh, high L CMB polarization data uh, from possibly from ACT and SVT, but definitely from CMB S, or CMB S4 <laughs> will help us uh, actually detect early dark energy if it exists. So I've spoken to you a lot about the Hubble tension, about how early dark energy resolves it. But where do we go from here? We have the Hubble tension, but there's a new growing discrepancy in cosmology, which is equally interesting. Um, the Hubble tension deals with the homogeneous expansion uh, of space, but the universe isn't homogeneous and isotropic. We have galaxies and clusters and vast spaces between them with nothing. The universe has matter density fluctuations and we can get an estimate on these matter density fluctuations, for example, using the lambda CDM model in the early universe. Here is a parameter that uh, tracks exactly this. We have one measurement of matter density fluctuations, just like the Hubble tension. We can do this in the late universe too, and we get a different measurement and a new growing anomaly in cosmology, which we call the large scale structure tension. Right now, this is roughly at the three sigma level, but it has also been growing. Let me show you what this looks like. We have the amplitude of matter density fluctuations here, sigma eight, versus the amount of matter in the universe. And we have several different measurements uh, on this uh, 2D plane, including from the CMB in green, gray-ish here, and in yellow, red, and blue through late universe measurements, either weak lensing measurements or galaxy cluster counts. So this S8 tension depends, uh, sorry, the S8 tension arises between these two measurements where we have the CMB inferred value under predicting, sorry, over predicting the amount of matter density fluctuations in the universe. Again, a huge effort has been mounted to measure this. And as measurements have become more precise, the tension has grown. Now, you might ask, where does early dark energy come in? It already solves the Hubble tension. Let's see what it does for this one. It's a little bit confusing now because early dark energy actually makes this tension a little worse. Not a lot worse, but it certainly doesn't help this tension. 
So what does this mean for early dark energy? Let's now um, add this large scale structured data, which is intention uh, to our constraints on early dark energy and ask what is the effect of adding this new data to early dark energy constraints? Unsurprisingly, the constraints on early dark energy do become stronger. Here again, I'm showing you work by my colleagues, Tristan Smith uh, et al. Uh, I specifically want to draw your attention to the gray and the red, where the gray is showing you early dark energy fit with just the CMB, and then what happens when you add large scale structure. Let me draw your attention specifically to this 1D plot here. So in terms of going from with just the CMB to CMB plus large scale structure, we go from the gray line to the red line. And you can see that the red line has less FEDE. It's constraining early dark energy more strongly. But what is really the origin of the discrepancy between large scale structure and the CMB? This is another important question to ask because the truth is that the large scale structure tensions exists not just with early dark energy, it already existed in Lambda CDM. Turns out the origin of this discrepancy is within Lambda CDM. It's within a Lambda CDM parameter, specifically the amplitude of the primordial power spectrum. Large scale structure prefers a smaller amplitude um, of the primordial power spectrum AS, while the CMB prefers a higher value of AS. So here's an exercise we can do. We can allow large scale structure and the CMB to have different values of AS. This is not something we're encouraging. This is just something my collaborators tried to demonstrate is the real source of the tension. So here we add this split between the two different ASs. And now I want to draw your attention to the dark blue and the green contours. Let's start by looking at this specific plot. Here we have um, the ratio between ASs as preferred by large scale structure and the CMB. And you can see that one is at roughly two sigma or even higher. Essentially, um, large scale structure definitely prefers a much smaller AS than the CMB. Two, if we allow the split, what happens to the constraints of large scale structure on early dark energy? So let me draw your attention back to this specific plot where we had going from the gray to the red, we were adding large scale structure. Now, if we also add the split, we go from the red to the dark blue. Essentially, all stringent constraints brought on by large scale structure onto early dark energy vanish. So this leads us in a pretty confusing place. Um, and we're still trying to figure out what this means, for example, for Lambda CDM, which has both the Hubble and the large scale structure tension, for early dark energy, which only has a large scale structure tension, but made slightly worse. And what this tells us about what a new concordance model of cosmology should look like, which ideally should have neither tension. Let me take you through my talk, um, uh, summarize my talk for you. Uh, and say a little bit about how we go about finding a new cos a concordance cosmological model. The Hubble tension is urgent and it could indicate new physics beyond the standard Lambda CDM model. A whole lot of focus has gone into the Hubble tension recently <laughs> with at least one new Hubble tension paper every week. And it has not been easy to resolve. My research um, led to the resolution, the first resolution of this discrepancy <laughs> Um, in the form of early dark energy. And it has inspired several papers that can actually um, emulate early dark energy with different fundamental physics. It's as good or better at fitting data relative to Lambda CDM and incoming CMB data can test early dark energy. In terms of the large scale structure tension, uh, this is a challenge that early dark energy faces. But one, this tension arises within Lambda CDM. And two, it could be that different avatars of early dark energy have different implications for this large scale structure tension. 
we've already seen that two different fundamental models of early dark energy led to two pretty different um, Hubble parameters. This could also be true for the large scale structure uh, parameters. It might also happen that, um, sorry, I should also say that early dark energy, even if it doesn't solve the large scale structure tension, it could be used as a stepping stone to find the new concordance model of cosmology. Solving both these tensions remains the current holy grail in cosmology. And it could turn out that these two different tensions need two very different solutions. Finally, I want to say that early dark energy presents um, solutions not only to the Hubble tension, but it also helps us um, explore ideas for other eras of accelerated cosmic expansion, like the current era, uh, which is dominated by dark energy, and also inflation. Models of inflation and models of dark energy can be applied to early dark energy and vice versa. So this is a rich field of exploration with applications beyond just the Hubble tension. The ultimate goals of cosmology are to understand dark energy and dark matter. Lambda CDM is a phenomenological model that always needed to be replaced by more fundamental physics. Maybe all these discrepancies in cosmology are finally illuminating this new, this fundamental physics that underlies everything. Perhaps we're at the brink of finally getting more insight into the dark sector through the Hubble tension, the large scale structure tension, and whatever other cosmological anomalies lurk beneath the surface. With that thought, I'll leave you. I hope you enjoy the conference and I hope you have questions for me. Thank you.